just arrived. In October 2019, I travelled to one of the world's infamous countries, Colombia. Home to some of the deadliest drug cartels on the planet. Whilst there, I travelled with the military, interviewed a hitman, and even spent the day with a local youth group. But Colombia was much more than that to me. The people, the cities, and the culture. Since returning back to the UK, the world has been forced into change. I wanted to find out how the UK and Colombia are tackling the coronavirus in their own different ways. I don't know why they don't help. Shit, I've never seen it this busy, you know. More and more people are trying, are trying to get involved into organised crimes. Eh, después de Brasil, eh, con más casos, ¿cierto? Well, you see, roads in my dog. I had to be around, if you know what to do there. Find a way. COVID-19, the pandemic that swept the globe. A year ago today, we went about our lives as normal. Now, many countries remain in lockdown. There are over 18 million cases worldwide and over 845,000 deaths. Experts question why we wasn't ready for this pandemic. Tomorrow, I'll start my journey looking at the impact the coronavirus has had on the UK. Many places around the country have been affected, but I was taking a look at one in particular. So I'm just on my way to Oldham, a town in Greater Manchester. Now there's fears of a second lockdown in this town, so I'm hopefully going to speak to some of the residents and see how they feel about it. Oldham, once known as the boom town of the Industrial Revolution, has now sadly become the most deprived town in the United Kingdom. After 200 people were struck down by the virus in one week, it's now rapidly taking over Leicester as the number one hotspot for COVID-19. There's not many people out really, as you can see the market's completely dead. With most of the town deserted, I managed to catch up with Wazim. He owned a local shop on the high street. I wondered whether his business had been affected with the current restrictions ongoing. It has. Uh, since the reopen, we've noticed the sales have come down quite a bit. So at the moment it is a struggle. There's few businesses that have closed inside market as well. Uh, due to them not getting any help for their rent while they were closed. So yeah, uh, it doesn't, the future is, it's unpredictable and we're not sure exactly what's going to happen. Oldham currently has a 15% unemployment rate, so a second lockdown would be catastrophic for businesses. With many staying indoors, I was finding it hard to get a real gauge of Oldham's current COVID crisis. I caught up with John. He told me that his wife had caught the coronavirus whilst out working in South Africa. I questioned whether he feared living in the UK's number one hotspot for the ongoing pandemic. In one way it does, because I'm here, my wife is in South Africa, so... Touch wood, I don't catch it. Although the town was quiet, it seemed as though the people of the once capital of cotton and textiles were getting by the best they could. Yeah, there are not a lot of people about anyone. So I know two people who've had it. Yeah, they're covered. You're gonna get it, you're gonna get it, whatever you do. After being in the area for almost two hours, it seemed as though most people was obeying the rules and staying indoors. But what was interesting is that every person I did speak to had a friend or relative who had caught the virus. My time in Oldham was nearly over. On the way home, I decided to visit a local park and got chatting with Hassan. He raised his concerns over a second wave. I look in media and the radio, TV and paper. They say maybe another, maybe another wave coming. Europe, maybe whole Europe. And that's why we need to be careful. I asked Hassan if the guidelines he was receiving from the government was sufficient. If this is only to me, my life, what I like, this is to me. But if the effect to you, to them, to anybody else, and this I must need to follow. Uh, government say, or uh, NHS, or doctors say. Michelle, a local resident who had struggled with the lockdown, was out picking her husband's prescription up when she decided to tell us her story. I can't hug real friends. 
you know, I keep downstairs. I sleep on the settee, my husband's upstairs. So obviously you mentioned that you're out picking your husband's prescriptions up. Is he not able to leave the house due to the coronavirus or? He's got a scooter like mine and he can't go out because he's high risk. Basically, I look after him 24-7 and I've got well either. I really poorly myself. So what, what do you think about people wearing masks then, like in public and things like that? It's peeking up into it and I've just been in shops and nobody's wearing masks. Michelle then told me she was receiving little to no help from the government. She then decided to end the interview. I don't know why they don't help. I think after speaking with Michelle, it's obviously she's in a difficult situation. Not only is she looking after her, her husband, she's looking after herself and I don't think she's getting the help she needs. Although she did say she's getting some help, I don't think it's enough and her going out for her husband's prescription in this kind of climate, especially in Oldham itself, I think she's, she's definitely at risk. Why can't there be someone there to, to drop the prescription off? I think what I've learned about my time in Oldham is that the businesses themselves are, are really struggling. The town centre was something like I've never seen before. It's a ghost town. And the people themselves, yeah, there's a real community spirit, but I don't think they're getting the help they need. And I spoke to a business owner, he said that there's nobody even coming into the shop, profits have dropped. But I think when, when we eventually get to see a bigger city, Manchester, it's gonna be completely different. As I drove through the outskirts of Manchester, I already started to notice the difference in the amount of people gathering on the streets. Things seem to be getting back to normal. I spoke with Joe in the centre, who seemed to confirm my first impressions. I think it is, definitely, like a lot of more people walking out on the street and then my like, restaurants are open, I see people chilling out every day in the sun. Although Manchester seemed to be thriving again, Joe feared the worst for local businesses. So I feel like it's affected business a lot, definitely. And then I've had friends um, who's lost their jobs. So it's definitely financially um, influenced a lot. As I went further into the city, I caught up with Sophie who was returning back to her bar job after nearly four months in lockdown. It's still very strange um, having to be seated and like, having to wear the past advisors and stuff. It's quite clinical at points, but I think as normal as it could get, practically, yeah, everyone's out, like, it's a nice day. I was interested to see if she had the help she needed from the government. I was furloughed for the whole um, lockdown, and then um, I've just been taken off furlough last week. So I'm still on about 60% furlough, and then getting the pay for the hours, but now I just get the hours. The Office for National Statistics announced the UK economy fell by a staggering 20.4% between April and June 2020. They later announced job losses of over 730,000 people since lockdown began. The way things are going, I do feel like there is going to be a, a second wave. Because um, as much as we've tried to be as social distance as possible in certain situations, we're still being encouraged to go, like the eat out to help out thing, still being encouraged to go out. Um, so I feel like it, it might happen, yeah. After Manpower Group carried out a survey with over 8,000 employees, 73% of them had negative feelings about going back to the workplace after fears of a second wave. With Manchester known for its music, I wanted to see what the nightlife was like after nearly four months in lockdown. Freight Island a local venue which was designed around the new social distancing restrictions was hosting Jordan Maxey's first live performance since the pandemic began. According to the Nighttime Industries Association, 50% of businesses in the sector 
will not survive longer than two months without further government support. So I was receive a call off a friend on the other side of Manchester, Rush Home. Apparently it's getting overcrowded down there, so we're gonna have a quick look in the car, see if it's any different to in here. Manchester's Curry Mile, famous for its streets being busy into the early hours of the morning. Thousands travel from across the country every week for a taste of authentic Indian food as it is named one of the top bucket list attractions in the UK. Although the street never sleeps, I was shocked to see how busy it was with local lockdown still in place. Shit, I've never seen it this busy, you know. Fucking rammed. Later that night, Rush Home was closed down for public safety. So I've got back from Manchester city centre and wow, I'm shocked to say the least. Not only in Rush Home, but Manchester, there's hundreds of people out on the streets, people are getting back to normal life. Whereas Oldham, the complete opposite. It's a ghost town, the businesses are struggling, the people are struggling. So I think it's gonna be interesting when we do get to speak to some people in Colombia, whether it's different over there. Colombia, a country with over 650,000 coronavirus cases and over 20,000 deaths. Birthplace to underground legends such as Pablo Escobar and home to some of the current richest cocaine dealers on the planet. It is said that 65% of the world's cocaine production is produced in Colombia. Not long before the world was hit by COVID-19, I travelled to some of the country's most infamous cities. I was really drawn to the people in the country, so I was naturally concerned when the pandemic hit. Living a normal life in Colombia seemed to be difficult before, with money problems and constant lures from organised criminals. I can't begin to imagine how difficult it has got since lockdown began. With travel restrictions still in place, I caught up with Oscar on video call, a sociologist and youth worker from Medellin. Hola. Hello. Hola. Como vamos? How are you? According to Oscar, Colombia seems to be struggling now more than ever. ¿Cómo está Colombia en esta pandemia? Bueno, es hay cosas y vemos que se puede tomar desde un aspecto muy amplio porque es compleja la situación. Los índices de informalidad laboral en Colombia son muy altos y claramente la gente tiene que salir a la calle a rebuscarse la comida diaria para ellos y para sus hijos, ¿cierto? Entonces, es difícil el asunto de que se sigan las reglas. Hay personas que lo hacen, sin embargo, hay muchas que no. Pero es por, no es porque no quieran, sino porque ustedes no pueden. Y las ayudas que llegan del Estado no son suficientes. I know last time I visited Colombia, I spoke to you in Medellín, which was a very uh, turbulent place at the time. Has it got worse since the coronavirus? Bueno, sí, especialmente hay que hablar, digamos, en términos de tiempo, porque al principio se presentaron varios motivos, precisamente porque no había la suficiente claridad sobre lo que era el coronavirus. Habían ya infectados dentro de los penales y no había tampoco una atención médica adecuada. Entonces, eso generó eh, que al interior de los penales pues se generaran situaciones complejas, no solamente al interior de los penales, también, digamos, en los barrios especialmente, eh, en los barrios populares de las grandes ciudades de las, de, del país, porque eh, había, se estaban dando, aunque desde el gobierno central se había dicho que no se podían hacer desalojos ni, que, ni sacar a las personas de sus casas, pues se hicieron esos, esa clase de operativos y eso generó enfrentamientos fuertes. When I visited you back in 2019, Oscar, you was persistent that the Colombian government and country was going in the right direction. Do you still think that's the case? 
digamos aquí se vuelve mucho más complejo el tema porque es, tenemos una guerra interna, ¿cierto? un conflicto armado interno todavía el proceso de paz eh, ayudó un poco a mermar eh, si se quiere las, eh, las, las tasas de homicidio y demás ¿cierto? y enfrentamientos con las fuerzas militares pero, pero siguen todavía activos muchos grupos eh, han aprovechado la cuarentena para fortalecer sus rutas estratégicas del tráfico ilícito Last time I was in Colombia, there seemed to be a real sense of community spirit. I presume that's only got stronger since the lockdown began. Creo que antes se ha fortalecido las relaciones comunitarias, sí, bastante, porque ante un estado precario en, en términos de su atención real, concreta, a tiempo de la de la comunidad y del pueblo pues le toca a la misma gente organizarse y mirar las estrategias para poder suplir las necesidades, ¿cierto? Oscar, this might be a bit of a difficult question for you. If you could describe Colombia in one word for its current state, what word would that be? Uh, yo creo que la palabra que más eh, ha estado en estos momentos se ha estado siempre es la, la fuerza. ¿No? Yo creo que eh, la fuerza, eh, y podríamos decirlo en relación a la solidaridad. ¿no? Latin America makes up 8% of the world's population, yet has a shocking 50% of worldwide coronavirus cases. Colombia currently stands sixth in the world behind Peru for the most active cases, whilst Brazil sits in third. So after speaking with Oscar earlier in the day, it's kind of interesting that he's mentioning very similar things to the UK in terms of the smaller towns not getting the help they need, whereas the bigger towns, they are getting some help, but it's still not enough. He also mentioned the drugs trade. That only seems to be getting stronger in Colombia in terms of producing and exporting the drug. Tonight, I've luckily managed to get an interview with a drug dealer in Birmingham He's going to be giving us an insight into whether the coronavirus has affected the trade over here, whether the prices have rose, and hopefully we're going to find out whether the pandemic has affected the UK drug trade. So thank you for speaking with me today. I know obviously it's a sore subject, what we're going to talk about the drugs trade. With the pandemic currently going on as the drugs trade affected you at all? Has it affected the drugs trade? Not really. We just be getting money, we, money regardless. Like, I think you just need to know it to trust, really. Obviously, roads are locked down. Hard to move around, but if you know what to do, then you find a way. Would it have cost me any more now? The prices are always slowly rising. But, yeah, I suppose prices are going Obviously, buying bigger, bigger amounts. That's when you're going to see a difference. It's going up slightly, like I say, but it's not really affecting the price on the street right now. Can you tell me roughly how much you'd make on a weekend? Obviously, good weekends. If you make anything from like fucking two grand. Depends, depends what's happening on the weekend. I think that's not... rising now that the coronavirus and everyone's on lockdown. Like I said, everyone's indoors, so what are you going to do? You just take more drugs. So we can, it's easy. A UN report has found the coronavirus pandemic has hit cocaine traffickers more than ever. Global lockdowns has brought transport to a near standstill and disrupted a business that relies on legal trade to camouflage its activities. The measures implemented by governments to counter the COVID pandemic has affected all aspects of the legal drug markets and trafficking. That means it has become more difficult for cartel members so they're turning to more innovative ways to export drugs. So last night I spoke with the drug dealer. He kind of confirmed that a lot more people are buying cocaine and drugs themselves because they're stuck in lockdown. So I think the pandemic has definitely affected the drugs trade itself. Tomorrow I'm going to be speaking with Oliver Smeig, who is a local journalist and fixer in Colombia. He knows a bit more about the drug trade in Colombia it's going to be a real interesting interview to see what it's like for people on the front line in Colombia. Hey Luis. Hello. 
How are you? Hi, it's you. It's a pleasure to meet you again. Pleasure to speak to you. Now, we started the lockdown, I think it was on the 23rd of March. They're finally now starting to lift the lockdown in some areas. Are you finding that's the same in Colombia? We started our, lo our lockdown back in March 24, so more or less the same time than you did in the UK. Yeah. But obviously, as we don't get any help uh, um, by the government, so people are getting, they, they have to get out, they have to try to make some money. So uh, lockdown was very strict like four months ago, but today it's, 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 it's losing its, its forces, you know? Colombia exports a huge amount of cocaine. I presume the prices have only gone up since the pandemic begun. I, I think the price is rising. I mean, that's, that's certainly a fact. Um, I agree on that. Bolivia, Colombia and Peru are the only countries in the world to produce the coca, cocaine's raw material. So on one hand, we do have coca farmers, which are not able to sell their leaves at that very moment. But on the other hand, we do have drug uh, dealers, high ranked drug dealers, which are still having a, a, a huge amount of hundreds or, or even thousands of tons of cocaine um, in, in stash houses around the whole country. So there's poverty for those who are working on the lower levels. And for those working on the higher level, businesses just keep on doing as it did before. There are some smuggling routes which are reduced, but other ones are still open. For example, the GoFast boats, they are running, they are operating at that very moment. Just a couple of sea miles away from Necocli, which was like the headquarter of the authorities, you might remember that. They busted a, a GoFast boat with one point something, 1.1 1 .1, uh, uh, tons of cocaine. So they are still operating. It said the value of the coca leaf had dropped by up to 73%. This could be a huge problem for Colombia, as it is estimated the drugs trade makes $10 billion per year. Here in the UK, it seems like everyone's pulling together. There's a real community spirit helping neighbours out, relatives out. Is that the same in Colombia? Yeah, I think that's, that's certainly uh, um, something which is happening. There's more solidarity um, between the neighbours, for example. People are trying to help them. Between families, they are trying to help their, their family members. Um, basically because there is no governmental help down here. Okay, and what sort of consequences has, has that had on Colombia? I know here it has hit the, the economy hard. Uh, in, 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 in basic terms, Luis, the coronavirus, the result of the coronavirus is that our society is getting separated more and more. More people are getting poor and extremely poor. And those who have been rich before, they keep on being rich. And then also, for example, our congressmen, they raised their own monthly income, like for $1,200, two or three days ago. Could you imagine that? I mean, our politicians are making more money right now. Meanwhile, people are, are, are dying on the streets because they are starving. And in terms of virus testing, things like that, would you go to the local hospital or would you have a test kit posted to your home? How have the government handled that? I mean, the health system almost broke down already. For example, it's almost unimpossible to get to get into an emergency room in, in Medellin, in the bigger cities in Medellin, in Cali or in Bogota. So people, mostly they, they stay back home. Wow. And you pay for your own medical care in Colombia, is that right? You, you, pay, you pay for it, yeah. We have to pay for it. And still paying, at that very moment, for example, I'm living in a middle-sized uh, uh, um, city, which is called Pereira. Um, which is a lot about a population of one million. I think um, our our health system at that very moment is almost broken. So if even if I pay, I probably won't get any any bed in in an emergency room at that very moment because they're just full. Do you feel the worst is yet to come for Colombia? I think so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we the statistics are like we do have at that very moment uh, um, every single day like ten thousand new. Um, in newly infected people um, by a population of 50 million. So that's a high rate. That's very comparable, I think, to, to Italy, for example, to Spain, one of the most affected countries in Europe. So I think the worst is still to come, definitely. I think what's been most interesting is that lower income areas, they've definitely been hit harder by this pandemic, whether that was physically, financially, it's been a huge setback for the working class around the world. A lot of small businesses and even workers were helped out by various government schemes, whether that was business loans or furlough. 
Whereas the Colombians, they don't seem to be getting any help at all. The after effects of it is a lot worse than the initial wave. Many of the conditions in South America is the hunger pandemic. This means people will naturally look to organise crime or illegal work as a means of survival. With cartels finding new and innovative ways to export the drugs, I feel their grip on Colombia is only getting stronger. So what's next for the people of the UK and Colombia? It's clear to me, regardless of the lockdown restrictions, communities across the world are pulling together. I think as the pandemic has gone on, people now are starting to question what the government are telling us, whether that be remaining locked down, go to work, stay at home. I think everyone's a bit confused. Although the world is slowly returning to normality, I fear the war on COVID has only just begun.